So my name is Lauri Kovan. I work as a developer in Helsinki, Finland most of the time, but I'm passing by New York on my way to San Francisco and I realized there were people who want to hear me talk here and decide to stop by. Uh, so I uh, used to do science at some point in my career and after I get a PhD on computational science, then I ended up to Nokia, then to Microsoft, and then to, to Smartly. I've been in Smartly for the last two and a half years working on various optimization features and testing and, and coding much of the stuff around ad studies and list studies. Uh, what I'm going to talk today is how to optimize your results for incrementality. Uh, I'm going to reveal you already that it's not a simple button that you can toggle, because if we had a button that optimizes for incrementality, I wouldn't be giving this talk. Uh, that would be super simple. What, what I try to cover today is, well, first, first of all, all good talks start with definitions, so I'm going to do that. Also, what is incrementality in the first place? Why should you care about incrementality? Uh, I'm going to show you four different ways of measuring incrementality, then talk about how that connects to attribution, uh, which is what you do uh, every, everyday life in practice. And finally, some practical or, or less practical recommendations to go on uh, to apply, apply your work tomorrow. First, what, what is incrementality really? Uh, Here is one way to look at it. There are four types of people. There are those who will never buy you, your product no matter what. For some reason, they're just not interested. They're just not in the product, in, the, in your audience. There are those who will always buy your product because they're a really big fan. They're right in the core audience. As soon as they just find out about, about your product or they know about your product already, they will always buy. Neither of these you should be targeting because it's a complete waste of money. The only group of people who you should be targeting is the second group from right, which is the people who only buy your product if they see your ads, which is, of course, very difficult to do because you don't, if you buy some product, you probably don't even know yourself that you bought it because you saw an ad. So if you don't know about that yourself, it's going to be very hard to find other people who buy your products because they saw your, saw your ads, which is why, in practice, whenever you target people on, on Facebook or online in general, you at least end up finding these two groups on the right, so people who buy your ads. And this is kind of the root cause of, of the whole trouble, why this is a topic that's worth talking about in the first place. The reason this happens is that it's very easy to get data on who buys your product. You, Facebook knows exactly who buys your product, which means that they can create all kind of complicated machine learning models to predict who will buy your product. If they knew who, who buys your product because of, of seeing your ads, they could use the same model to predict who is the incremental user, but they don't have the data, and hence they cannot really do that. They can only target people who buy your product. They have no idea generally whether, they, whether these people buy because of, your, because of seeing your ad or because they uh, just would buy, buy anyway. Uh, this is, of course, not, not anything new. There's this great, great guy, John Vanamaker, who said that half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble I know, trouble is I don't know which half. Uh, it's not that bad anymore. You can actually measure that. We can, for example, say that only, hey, 43% of your money is wasted. Uh, in some cases, we might even know like which 43%. Uh, things have improved a bit, but this still continues to be quite somewhat a tricky problem. Uh, one anecdote I have to mention about John Vanamaker. I live in East Village, I have an Airbnb there. Where I arrived in New York, I just happened to notice that it says Wanamaker there on, on a street sign because there's John Wanamaker uh, place, like half a mile that way if you just continue Broadway. The place is named after John Wanamaker uh, department store, and who is, you know who is, who is in there nowadays? Well, there's Facebook. Facebook has six floors of John Wanamaker department stores. Uh, they have their office there. The department store doesn't exist anymore. So what is incrementality exactly? Incrementality 
is the increase in sales caused by your ads. That's official definition. There are other things that are caused by your ads. For example, if you have retargeting ads, you might cause people to buy your products earlier. That's not incrementality because they would buy anyway, this buy earlier. Uh, that's not what we, what we are after here. There are other things that can increase your, your sales, like if you have a seasonality, for example, your sales are probably going higher during Christmas anyway. Uh, that's not what we want to measure. So how do you actually measure incrementality in practice? First, you start with the parallel universe. And this, uh, this is not a joke. This is actually how you should measure it in practice. So you show ads in this universe. You take a parallel universe that's otherwise identical, except that you don't show ads, and you measure the difference. And that's it. It's super simple. Unless you don't have a parallel universe, then you need to do some tricks. Uh, all of the different measurements I am going to discuss are based on this same idea. They use different ways to approximate a parallel universe. Uh, which is why we can only measure this approximately. We cannot measure this exactly. Any method, method of measuring incrementality is not going to be perfect. Uh, we can also only measure this in aggregate. So it's not possible to say of any single person that that guy was incremental. He bought because of seeing this ad. That's not going to happen. What you can know is that in this group of 10,000 people, we got, uh, we got 500 incremental purchases. And that's about it. It's not possible to show exactly who was the incremental dude. So how do you measure this in practice? The first I hope you have already heard of is Leaf study. Really the best way to measure incrementality if this applies to your case. Facebook does all the hard work here. Uh, it's, it's very robust, very simple to set up. The idea is very simple, uh, at least on the high level. You take your entire audience, you split it randomly in half, you show ads to one half, you don't show ads to the second half, and you measure the difference what happens. That's your parallel universe. The idea here is that the because we split people randomly, they are effectively identical groups of people, and then we can just see, see what, what is the difference that we get. Uh, this is not perfect. It's the best thing, usually. It's not perfect. Uh, first of all, you can only measure Facebook, uh, fa things that are measured by Facebook. So basically, Facebook pixel events, Facebook app events, Facebook. Uh, off-site events, uh, no lifetime value, for example. Uh, it's very easy to run, very, very robust. You can kind of trust the methodology because there is a proper random split at, at people level. And this is the way to run incremental measure, incrementality measurements if you, if you can. Uh, lift studies very often underestimate the lift that you get, and there are a few reasons for this. The first one is that there are lots of things that are outside what is measured by lift study. Usually, it's not just the single conversion you get, but it's something else. Uh, you get a kind of a lifetime value from the customers that's bigger than the single conversion that Facebook is tracking. Uh, there are branding effects that are not really caught by lift studies. Uh, and of course, uh, anything, any conversions that happen basically outside the lift study are not counted. Network effect is really interesting, and this is where the parallel universe comes, comes in handy. Uh, suppose you have a campaign that's like amazingly viral, that everyone who, who sees it wants to share it with their friends, and everyone is buying. What happens if you run a lift study? What happens is that you have this control audience, but everyone who sees the ad in the treatment audience, they are, they're really excited, they share it with all their friends, and the outcome is that everyone sees the ad, and everyone's buying, and your lift study will tell you that there is zero lift, because there's no, no difference between the treatment and control. Uh, in reality, things are usually not that bad, but this is kind of a one extreme case where you can get completely wrong result out of a lift study. Second way of measuring lift, I don't recommend this. I've, I've had really bad experiences. Uh, 
is a, is a PSA, a public service announcement. The idea is that you run a split test, basically an A-B test. You show you reel out the one half of the people, then you show something like a red cross out the second half, and you measure what is the difference. Uh, this is hard to do in Facebook or in online marketing in general, because there's usually some feedback loop in how Facebook targets people. So if you show them red cross ads, Facebook will target that, show that ad to, to a different kind of group than when you show your real ad, which makes it really hard to actually make this robust and reliable on Facebook. Uh, I can tell you more, more later about the horror stories of PSAs on Facebook. Uh, if you can avoid it, please do. A few other better options, if you, if you for some reason, cannot use lift studies. Uh, first is a geosplit. The idea is super simple. Again, just take two cities, show ads in one, don't show ads in the other, and, and measure the difference. In practice, no cities are identical, so you need to do some manual analytics to make out for any differences in, in those city sizes or, exam, or uh, market size, market face, anything like that. Uh, it can get even worse. You might have, for example, an earthquake in one city, and then that kind of throws off your lift study, and it's very hard to take into account. So basically, anything can happen during the lift study, uh, sorry, during the geosplit study that throws off your lift study. It requires a bit more manual work, but usually this is still better than running a PSA setup. Fourth way of measuring lift. Custom audience split. This you can do with remarketing. So if you have, a, for example, an email list, you just split that in half yourself, make a custom audience in Facebook from one half, and then track all the conversions in your own back end to figure out like, how many extra conversions you get in the group that sees hats versus those who don't. Uh, some issues that you need to take into account, well, of course, you can only use this with an existing audience. The second one is that the match is not 100%. You send emails to Facebook, they cannot match all of those emails. And what's even worse is that the match might not be random. So, for example, if Facebook, for some reason, just matches the kind of bad part of the audience who are not going to buy your product, then it looks like there is absolutely no lift. Even though those, those people that Facebook cannot match might be buying your product. You just cannot measure it this way. Uh, it's also hard to say how big of an issue that is because you don't know who is actually in the who is, who is matched and who, who is then in the actual control group. So, so much about measuring lift. What about attribution? How is that connected? So, if incrementality is the increase in sales caused by your ads, an attribution model is something that tries to give credit of your, of your ads to those, to those ads that cause conversions, then this kind of sounds similar, right? And they are similar. They're trying actually to do the same thing. And that's, that's not the difference. The difference is in how they do it. So everything I have been talking about so far has been an experiment. It's something you need to set up beforehand, where you need to collect the separate data set, and then in the end you get something, some result that's quite accurate, quite nice, but it requires an extra effort. On the other hand, we have attribution models that are based on observations. You don't need to set up anything, you just use whatever data you have, and you calculate incrementality. The reason you need both is because attribution models are real-time, and if you want to do optimization, you better have something that works in real-time. But attribution models are not accurate. They're models, mathematical models. They can be really horribly wrong, which is why you also need to calibrate those methods with uh, actual measurements. So you do need both. Uh, yeah, before I go there, what you notice is that everything on the right side is model, econometric model, rule-based model, attribution models, and whenever you hear the word model, this is what you should be thinking about. And uh, so all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this sounds funny, it sounds like an, it's an exaggeration, like, oh, that cannot be true, my model is correct, uh, but it's, it's not. I'm really serious about this. All models are wrong. Your attribution models are wrong. All, all models in physics are wrong. 
we might not know about it yet, but it's, it's a good philosophy to, to take for, for that. Uh, but, but models can still be useful. I'll give you an example. So if you use attribution models for retargeting, very often the campaigns look really great when you do retargeting. You get like amazing amounts of conversions from retargeting campaigns because that's the last thing that happens just before the conversion. It's probably not fully correct the number. And that's, that's because your model there is wrong. If you run a lift study, you might find out that you actually have zero lift from your uh, retargeting campaign, even though it looks amazingly good in a last click attribution model. Uh, the point is that models are wrong. They can still be useful, but you need to know where the limits are. It's completely okay to use an attribution model to compare, for example, two retargeting campaigns to each other. If you get like double the number of conversions in one, it's probably better. But if you try to compare a prospecting campaign and a retargeting campaign, uh, and you get more conversions in the retargeting campaign, that probably doesn't mean that it's, it's better. So how to optimize towards incrementality? This is a very high level of view. Use an attribution model, and then you'll run lift studies or any, any kind of measurements to calibrate the attribution model. Uh, what I mean by calibrate is that you usually calculate some kind of a multiplier uh, to reach the actual number that you get in your, in your lift study. Uh, you need to be careful with that because not all results generalize and, and lift can vary a lot between cities and, and countries and, and time, time and stage of market and so on. So you cannot, there is no like single multiplier that you can use to calibrate everything. You actually need to take, a lot, take into account a lot of different variables. Uh, but the, this is the basic idea, and the more lift studies you run, the more calibration you do, the more accurate your calibration gets. Uh, a short view of different attribution models. Uh, first, there is econometric models. These are very often used in uh, higher up at CMO, CMO level, mostly because you can do et econometric models using suspend data. Another name for this is marketing mix models. So idea, again, is super simple at the high level. If you get good sales in LA in December and you put a lot of money on Facebook in LA in December, it, has, it kind of suggests that uh, Facebook produced results except that you need to take into account the fact that sales might be higher for seasonality in, in LA in December. Maybe you had a, a, some other marketing running at the same time. Maybe you just dropped the price of your product, which caused it. So once you take all of these things into account that you can think of, put those into your model, then you have a marketing mix model that gives you the right number uh, of, of uh, kind of right credit for a different channels. The mathematical way to do that is, is uh, to run, use linear regression or anything like that, like regression analytics is basically what I described there. Uh, Rule-based models is what is usually used in online marketing, uh, because when you run, run ads on Facebook or any kind of uh, ad platform on, on internet, you actually have more data than just spent data. And it makes a lot of sense to include that data. You have data like this. You know basically the whole user path if you make the effort to collect all of this data. And this is a lot more data that goes into the marketing mix models. Uh, so we could collect all of the data of what happens before the conversion. We can make some rule of what, uh, what caused conversion. And then we have an attribution model. A simple example is the last click model, where it just say that uh, whatever happened last was the thing that caused the conversion, and then we can go on with our business. Uh, the bad thing is that this is, of course, really wrong to say that the last thing that happened caused the conversion. It's com totally not true. Uh, but it's, so it's really simple. It's really easy to understand that it's something you can actually use because you have to do something. 
you can create more complicated models. Models, they might get better, uh, but definitely they get more, more complicated. One way to get around this complicated stuff is that instead of making the rules yourself, you use a computer to generate the rules, which is where all of these data-driven algorithmic models come in. The idea for, for this is that you, uh, in, yeah, instead of creating the rules you, yourself, you use some nice, clever algorithm to decide the rules. Uh, it can be good or it can be bad. Uh, the fundamental problem is this one, that if you see two user paths where whenever you show ads on, on Twitter, there's a purchase. And whenever you don't show ads on Twitter, there is no purchase. So does this mean that Twitter causes those purchases, or does it mean that Twitter is just really good at predicting who will convert? And based on this data, you have absolutely no way to decide. And what makes this even worse is this is exactly what everyone, every online plat advertising platform is trying to do. They try to show ads to people who are more likely to convert. And if you use this data to build a model, it can go a bit wrong. Uh, finally, just to repeat the point about calibration, like whenever you calibrate, there is no, no such thing as a general multiplier, there's no such thing as a general lift. So lift varies by time, there are different lifts for different channels, you can have a 500% lift in your marketing really easily if you just start marketing in a new market where no one has ever heard about your product. Uh, I've seen that happen a few times, uh, but it doesn't mean that you would get a, the same 500% lift in any other channel or any other time. Finally, a few practical or less practical things. All models are wrong. Uh, your job is, if you're using models, and which you are, your job is, is to know what the, what the limitations are. Uh, if, if data is really bad, it might even be better to be make decisions based on hunch than really bad data. Uh, use measurements to calibrate your models, otherwise you, have, you don't really know how bad your models are. And this last point here is the reason why you are all, all listening to me here. Uh, this is still a topic that is very much not automated, so it's, and this is a very, very big decision, like to split money between different channels. It's one of the biggest decisions you can make in marketing. Facebook and Google and every other platform is kind of optimizing things and automating things within their own channel. So that's getting easier all the time. Currently, no one is, is solving the optimization between different channels or even solving the measurement between different channels. And that, that's still a work for humans this year, fortunately and unfortunately.